September 11th, 10 years ago, one man had his eyes glued on the president all day. He was focused on George W. Bush, wouldn't let him out of his sight. That man was Eric Draper, Bush's White House photographer who took some unbelievable pictures that day. Tonight, Draper, who now lives in Rio Rancho, gives us an exclusive look at what it was like to be with the president on 9-11. Page this was uh, just a few minutes after those famous words were whispered in his ear, uh, America's under attack. At this stage, uh, this is a, a room adjacent to the classroom. Where he had been reading to the children. Exactly. And someone placed the television set here. Carl was on the phone. He's talking with uh, Ari Fleischer here, the press secretary. His communications director, Dan Bartlett's here. The president's basically, basically collecting the facts, what we knew at that time, and because he was preparing for a statement, and you know, not only a statement to uh, this country, but to the world, the first reaction from the President of the United States about the attacks. And I was waiting for that moment that he would stop and actually acknowledge or see what was happening in, in New York, but he was so focused on the words. Uh, he didn't look up at this stage, even though he walked right in front of the television. <laughs> Dan Bartlett here, uh, the communications director, alerted everyone in the room seeing that horrific image of the second tower getting hit and that huge explosion. And that's when the president finally turned around to see that for the very first time. So for me, that was a significant moment to capture. He turned around for half a second and then um, turned back around and returned to his phone call. And everyone in the entire room was trying to collect information about what was happening. This is before the Blackberry days, so everyone had a pager, everyone had a cell phone. And at this stage, I think we're learning that there are other planes involved as well. And, and that's what made it, the scope of what was happening started to get bigger. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. After the statement, we, we left the school. Uh, we headed toward the airport. Uh, and we boarded Air Force One. Draper remembers Chief of Staff Andrew Card telling everyone to remove the batteries from their cell phones. Because we might be, being, might be, uh, be traced. You know, that that could be some way that, you know, whoever did this could be tracing us. The photographer also remembers the president giving everyone a pep talk. And he said, okay, boys, this is what they pay us for. It may not yet be over. It's unclear exactly who's behind it. The sooner we can get airborne, the better everyone felt. Uh, and the plane did, you know, um, elevate very quickly. And, uh, and again, we didn't know where we were headed. But I knew that the president wanted to return to Washington. And during this conversation, he was convinced or told that, no, we can't go. It's just, it's just not safe. Told. He was basically told. This is the stage around the 10 o'clock hour where we learned that the Pentagon was hit, that Flight 93 was airborne, that the White House was also a target, uh, and the Vice President was evacuated to the West Wing. The en entire U.S. airspace had been shut down. So there's a lot, a lot happening all at once. Those on Air Force One were also hearing other reports, not knowing what was true or false. We heard that a car bomb had exploded in front of the State Department. We heard that a fast-moving object was headed towards the president's ranch. Then the president shared something he had just heard. That Angel is the next target. And Angel is the code name for Air Force One. That was probably the scariest moment. Like at that moment, it was like, well, yes, we could also be a target, you know, the, the, the plane itself. What are these men talking about? Basically discussing where we're headed, the first stop, you know, where, where we're landing, what, what part of the country would be safe for the president to, to be. They decided to head to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. You can see visibly the president is not happy because he really wanted to return to Washington and lead. Lead the country from Washington. From, from, from the White House. And this is the horrific moment uh, aboard the plane as we watched the, the Twin Towers collapse. That was just a moment of this utter disbelief and silence. 
A short time later, they landed at Barksdale. This was the, the first time the president got, had a full briefing about the attacks. And we're on the ground for a couple hours in Louisiana, and, and you can visibly see the frustration on the president's face, you know, just the, the waiting, waiting to find out when we could return to Washington. The second stop uh, off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, something I, I didn't know until after I made this picture is that this airplane in the background here is the so-called doomsday plane, the plane that can refuel in the air and that, let's say, if there is a, a nuclear holocaust or something, you know, something obviously very bad, that the, the president could get on that plane and stay airborne for, you know, hours continuously, 24 hours continuously. Behind those doors, the president's receiving a top secret briefing. They wouldn't allow me in. I tried to get in, but I got kicked out. Below ground. Below ground. We're, we're in a bunker. And then uh, we finally learned that we're headed back to Washington. And as we approach Washington, D.C., you can see the, the fighter jets, the side of the window on one side. On the other side, the plume of smoke rising from the Pentagon. That's when it started to sink in for me that um, you know, this, was, this was going to be a war. On 9-12, the president was up before sunrise, trying to decide what he and the country should do next. Tomorrow night at 10, Draper takes us from the morning after to trying to convince British Prime Minister Tony Blair to join in the fight to a secret meeting at Camp David with the CIA. Two, that day in October, when the president announced it was time to hit back.